Hi, Rip Forsyth for the Brea Church of Christ, and welcome to Lesson 1-2. Now we're going to build on our last lesson uh, as we talk about how to approach God through His Bible, through the Word of God, biblical authority. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 6 in this lesson, if you want to start turning there in your Bible. And I want to introduce you to a couple new terms in this lesson. One of them is called pattern. Uh, when God wants us to obey Him, when God wants us to do something, He gives us a pattern. Um, and you follow that pattern. And we're going to talk about in this lesson how to develop that pattern in Scripture, how to respect it. Um, but we use patterns all the time. If you're going to build a house, you have to follow the blueprints, right? That's your pattern. You can't go outside that pattern. You've got to do what that pattern says. Uh, you can't just add what you want to it. Um, if you are one that likes to sew, uh, you follow a pattern. And if you don't follow that pattern, you're going to have one sleeve longer than the other. So um, we're going to look at and start developing God's patterns in this series. And so we're going to take a look at when God is very specific but we're also going to talk about some times when God is silent, when God doesn't say this or that about something. Sometimes that becomes authorized. Um, I call that general authority, and we'll talk about that in this lesson. But then there's also some times where God is silent, He hasn't spoken, and we must be silent, meaning we must not practice it at all. And we'll talk about that as well. So um, let's look at the story of Noah and the flood, and we'll build upon that. I think most people are familiar with this story, where um, it's been over uh, a thousand years, I think some, something like 1,500 years, the man has dwelt on the earth, and he has corrupted his way so bad that God looks upon the earth and he is, he is sad. He is sad the way that things have gotten. In fact, let's take a look at Genesis chapter uh, 6, and let's start at verse 5. Ge uh, Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of the man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a pretty bad statement, isn't it? Verse 6. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things, to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But, and here's the contrast, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. And Noah became the father of three sons, Shen, Ham, and Yapeth or Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. So as you stop right there, you'll notice that things are not good. And God has a plan. There's something that God wants to accomplish. In essence, we have one of the very first judgments of God. What shows a loving God and yet another part of God, and that is where he cannot leave sin go unpunished. So God is going to blot out the earth, all living creatures. But God also in his love um, saves the righteous. And that's going to be Noah and his family. So as you look at the story, the way it comes down is that God has to save the righteous. And so he's going to talk with Noah, but what does he have to do? He has to tell Noah, this is how you're going to survive the judgment. This is how you're going to survive the flood. In fact, the flood doesn't even really become stated until later on in this chapter. So as you look at verse 13, God now comes to Noah, and this is where we really want to look at our story. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. 
And behold, I'm about to destroy them with uh, them with the earth. Now, interesting, he doesn't say anything about the flood specifically at this point, but he does tell them to start making an ark. And the Hebrew author in Hebrews chapter 11 talked about that Noah was warned about things not yet seen. And a lot of people think <clears throat> that that means it had never rained. Others think it never flooded. Um, but obviously, whatever happened, whatever it's talking about, no one had ever seen that before. And if they had never seen it rain, because Genesis, I believe, 2.5 says a mist used to come up and water the earth rather than the rain. Um, that just adds an extra dimension to this story. So here is God's, if you will, plan of salvation. This is how Noah's going to save himself. Verse 14. <clears throat> make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood water upon the earth. Destroy all flesh, which is the breath of life, from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of everything of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. To keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Now the interesting thing is when you get down to the animals, a lot of people think that all we have is two of every animal. But as you read in chapter 7, you find out that's not really the case. God divides the animals uh, by what he calls clean versus unclean and by numbers. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 1, then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone, notice that, for you alone, I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Just stop right there. Uh, a lot of people think that if a majority of people are doing something, they can't be wrong. The Bible paints a very opposite picture of that. The Bible picture paints that most of the time, the majority of people are heading in the wrong direction. They have the wrong idea. They're practicing the wrong things. Here, a total of eight people. Of all the people on the earth are doing the right thing. All right, verse 2, chapter 7, verse 2. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. And so you see that the clean animals were taken by sevens. Now, what is interesting, <coughs> is there a little question here? Does that mean seven animals? Meaning three pairs and one extra? Or does that mean seven pairs? I think most people take it to be seven pairs. But the interesting thing is that when Noah leaves the ark in Genesis 9, the very first thing he does is he offers a sacrifice of every clean animal. Well, that might be the extra seventh one, so that after that sacrifice, what you have is three pairs of clean animals. Um, not sure if that's the right answer, but that is interesting how that all evens out. Also, there's a question about clean versus unclean. A lot of people have come to know that clean animals are animals you could eat, and unclean animals you can't eat. Well, you might remember that again in Genesis 9, after the flood, it is not until that time that God allows the eating of animals. 
prior to that, from the Garden of Eden onward, they ate simply fruits and plants and, and herbs and such things. They were, in essence, vegetarians. But after the flood, God then allowed them to eat animals. And he put the fear of man into the animals. And that's why so many of them just flee from us. It's, it's built into them by God. So if it's not the eating of animals, and it could be, some people think this is a precursor, what can clean versus unclean mean? Well, um, it's possible that the designation clean versus unclean was that um, there were certain animals uh, known to Noah, directed by Noah, to Noah by God, that could be sacrificed, and certain animals that were not to be sacrificed. And that, again, keeps in accordance with what we read later on in the law, that there were only certain animals that were sacrificed and some that were not. As well as Genesis 9, where Noah does sacrifice simply the clean animals. Nothing is mentioned of the unclean animals. And that, to me, seems to be the answer to that. So there are sevens, maybe seven clean animals, seven pairs, perhaps. And then the unclean animals came by twos, two pairs, um, which might, again, make equal the sevens and the twos and so forth. But um, what we really want to look at is the pattern that God gives to Noah. Um, as you look at this story, you can see that um, God was very specific about what to do, okay? And I want you to take a look at this list. We're going to put up there very quickly. But as you look at Genesis 6 and part of Genesis 7, this is what we might call the specifics that God commanded. Very, very easy to understand. This is what God wants, okay? But now let's take a look at what I've labeled generic authority. These are things that God hasn't said anything about. I want you to notice that he doesn't say, Noah, I want you to use tools. And here's the tools that I want you to use, right? He doesn't do that. So he can't use tools? No, he can. That becomes authorized under the command to build. <clears throat> okay? So <clears throat> anything that he needs that becomes necessary or what we might say as an expedient or an aid uh, to build the ark, to fulfill that command to build it, that becomes authorized, okay? And so things like um, using of nails and saws and hammers and things like that, um, they all become authorized because he says to build it. You have to build it. He doesn't have to tell Noah every single tool, everything to use. He simply says, build it, and everything else becomes authorized. Now, in this list of generic authority, one key requirement, whatever we, we add to do this, whatever we put under generic authority, cannot break any of the specific pattern. If I, if I do something that changes the specifics, well, then I've disobeyed God, okay? So that's key to understanding generic authority. And where this becomes important is that when we get to Christianity, when we get to the New Testament, we can do the exact same things for what we're commanded to do, to worship Him, to sing to Him, uh, the partaking of the Lord's Supper, and so forth, we're going to see the similar patterns that we can find in the New Testament. Now, I want to introduce you to what I call God's silence. Here's a whole nother column. Um, just like the generic column, these are things that God was silent about. He didn't say anything about them. But these are things that are not authorized. These are not things that come under 
uh, generic primarily because they change the specific pattern. And this is something that so many churches do not teach about the Bible. There is this whole thing about, well, if the Bible doesn't condemn it specifically, directly, then you can do it. Well, that simply is not true. And that's what you're going to see in all of these lessons, uh, both Old Testament and even in the New Testament. Um, God doesn't have to condemn or tell us not to do everything he doesn't want us to do. Can you imagine how big the Bible would be? So what does he do? He simply tells us, here's what I want you to do. Um, so I want you to take a look. What about wood? God commanded specifically to use what? Gopher wood. Okay. Well, what if it was easier in the days of Noah to find cedar? Uh, right? Lebanon? I don't know if it was anywhere close to this. Uh, but it was easier to find cedar. It was easier to work with pine, right? We make a lot of furniture out of pine. It's a good, sturdy, easy to work with. What, what if he thought, man, go for wood is so... It's not a good wood. I'm going to use this other wood. God never said I couldn't, and that's true. God never said he couldn't. There's no specific restriction on other kinds of wood. Well, simple logic tells us no, because that would break what God said specifically. God said use gopher wood. Well, that's, that's not the same thing that people use today. People today will what? People today will add all sorts of things. And again, we'll, we'll get into more of the specifics of the New Testament in a, a later lesson. But we're laying the groundwork here that we can understand how we approach God from the New Testament as Christians today. We can't simply add something that changes what God specifically says simply because he didn't directly condemn it. We've got to be silent where God is silent. Um, I want to add this. <clears throat> what if Noah was an animal lover? And he said, okay, of all the clean animals, <clears throat> I'm going to get the seven that God said. Let's say it's seven. I'm going to get the seven that God said, but I'm going to actually bring ten. I'm obeying God. Because I have the seven, but I'm going to add three more. I just just really love animals. Well, is Noah being obedient to God simply because he has seven? No, because we understand, again, logically, that God said seven for a reason. Do I have to understand why he wanted seven? No, I don't. I just have to trust him. I just have to obey him. That He knows what he's doing. He revealed seven. He didn't reveal anything else. He didn't reveal the reason. I don't need to know the reason. God knows the reason and I trust him. And I think most of us can understand if you keep adding animals, number one, you're di being disobedient because you're breaking the specific pattern. God wanted seven. No more, no less. Even if I don't understand that, I've got to obey him. I think, again, we can understand, perhaps, the idea is there just wouldn't be enough room. If we keep adding animals, there's not going to be room for all the different species that he wants to put on the ark. Um, I want you to notice as well, in the specific pattern, there are command that there be three decks and one door and one window. Can I add windows and doors and decks? No, I can't. But there is some liberty. He tells them to make it with rooms. I don't know what exactly these rooms look like, how big they were, but he just says plural. So it's up to Noah, as long as he has a plurality, as to how many rooms he needs. So there again is some liberty, some freedom 
within the commands, within the authority of God. And so I hope that makes sense. It's an important lesson that God gives us patterns, even a day, of what we are to do. Sometimes things are generically authorized because he commands us to sing or because he commands us to take the Lord's Supper. But there are other times where things are not authorized. They are God's silence. And we must respect that. They break the specific pattern. And so we're not going to add it to our practice. And so... That concludes lesson 1-2 as we talk about how to approach God through biblical authority. It's an important concept, especially that idea of respecting God's silence because a lot of churches don't do that. Again, you can't simply say, if God didn't condemn it, then I can do it. If God didn't specifically say I can't do it, that doesn't make it authorized. Um, we're going to see that again in the next lesson and so if you would like to please now go to lesson 1-3 about the sin of Nadab and Abihu and again thank you for watching and we'd love you to come and visit us at the Brea Church of Christ the address is there uh, here is our website uh, you obviously know our website but our email is there as well you can email us with any questions, any comments you have, we very much appreciate that. Thank you so much for studying with us, and we'll see you in Lesson 1-3.